All right, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam wa ala ashrafil anbiya wa al-mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa sirli amri wa ahlu luqtutam min lisani yafqahu kawli. This must be the fifth or the sixth session. And today it's about the problem of evil. So it's quite a, an interesting topic. I just want you to listen to this for a moment. Suppose what Oscar believed in as he died, in spite of your protestations, suppose it's all true, and you walk up to the pearly gates and you are confronted by God. What will Stephen Fry say to him, her, or it? I will basically, that is the Odyssey, I think, I, I'll say, bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that it is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world which is so full of injustice and pain? That's what I'd say. And you think you're going to get in? No, I, but I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to get in on his terms. They're wrong. Now, if I died and it was, it was Pluto, Hades, and if it was the 12 Greek gods, then I would have more truck with it because the Greeks were... They didn't pretend not to be human in their appetites and in their capriciousness and in their unreasonableness. They didn't present themselves as being all-seeing, all-wise, all-kind, all-beneficent. Because the God who created this universe, if it was created by God, is quite clearly a maniac, utter maniac, totally selfish, totally... We have to spend our life on our knees thanking him? What kind of God would do that? Yes, the world is very splendid, but it also has in it insects whose whole life cycle is to burrow into the eyes of children and make them blind. They eat the outwards from the eyes. Why? Why did you do that? You could easily have made a, a creation in which that didn't exist. It is simply not acceptable. So, you know, atheism is not just about the, not believing there is a, is not believing there's a God, but on the assumption that there is one. What kind of God is he? It's perfectly apparent. He is monstrous, utterly monstrous, and deserves no respect whatsoever. The moment you banish him, your life becomes simpler, purer, cleaner, more worth living than my opinion. That sure is the longest answer to that question <laughs> that I ever got in this entire series. So that's quite powerful. All right. But that, that is very powerful in terms of the rhetoric. Right? His eloquence and his prose, just when he frames it like that, whether we agree with it or not, it's very powerful. And all of the four horsemen, the, this atheistic horsemen, they're very, very powerful when it comes to them. Let's try to break that down. Let's try to break that down. So it's quite emotionally charged. So he says that, what would you do when you meet God? All right, he says that I wouldn't want to meet him on those terms. All right, so there's an element of arrogance there. It says that even if he sees reality, excuse me, hit him in the face, all right, he'll, he'll deny it and he'll try to argue with that intelligent being in a way that they are somehow equal to each other. So he says, so he argues about primarily about bone cancer, right? He says that there is inherently, there is evil embedded within the world. And then he's now challenging God, well, why does God create so much evil, right? That even if you're sinless, right, you're still subject to, potentially, you're still subject to evil. And he says that why should I respect such a mean-minded, stupid, capricious, Right, an evil God who's created this world with full of injustice. That's quite a, quite again, that's a very powerful play. All right, and he says that he wouldn't want to get into heaven on his terms. And we'll come to that hopefully later on. Now, the first thing that I wanted to, to you do was to ask, well, look at atheism at its core. Right, so Richard Dawkins, who's one of the four main henchmen of this particular wave in the modern world, 
says that in a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, i.e. this brute fact. Other people are going to get lucky. And you will not find any rhythm or reason in it, nor is there any justice embedded within the world. This universe that we observe has the precise properties that we should expect if at the bottom of it there is no design, there is no purpose, there is no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. So this is the position that they take on one hand. And on the other hand, Stephen Fry argues shadow boxes, a God that does not exist in a vacuous world, which evil does exist, okay, but denies that there is somebody behind that evil, right? And he's trying to argue his case. So he says, Richard Dawkins says that there is no evil. Because there is no God. Now, the first thing that I wanted to say is that we really need to approach this topic with a little bit of care. Right? This particular problem of evil has real issues. I mean, people suffer all of the time, whether it's mental, whether it's spiritual. Okay, and you can't approach this particular topic from a metaphysical perspective that we'll be touching today. Right. In, in that manner when you're facing a person who is really suffering. So that requires quite a lot of pastoral care. That requires compassion. That requires empathy. Okay? This is really, we've got the privilege of stepping back from that. And we're just having a look at it from a, an overall metaphysics perspective. How do we get ourselves comfortable with these particular types of issues and how do we handle those types of issues so that is something that i just wanted to if you put out there in in the early case now this problem of evil is what some scholars have classified as the boulder problem i mean it's the unmovable boulder and they say that this is such a great issue right such a such a twist within a faith-based narrative that you just can't get away with, right? And this particular chap, Anthony Flew, right, who used to be an atheist, who now changes his mind and I think he's become a Christian, he says that the problem of evil touches upon what some refer to as the cardinal of all problems, i.e. the main kernel, the main gem of the issue, with the integrity and the cohesiveness of faith. And those are my words in italics and in the issue brackets, Christian faith. And I'll come back to those. It is cited as the most common reason for abandoning Christianity or faith and embracing atheism. Okay, so quite a lot of people leave the traditional faith. Many reasons. But the problem of evil is being cited as one of, well, one of the main ones. Remember that diagram that I showed you? It was kind of a mind map um, where it said all, all the problems and there were three particular type of areas. One was personal trauma, one was the scientific and the philosophical concerns, and the other one was, was a, uh, um, the social concerns. Well, this is obviously one of those. So the problem of evil has been articulated by a Greek philosopher, Epicurus. And uh, he actually did this um, in the 270 BC. And then it was later framed by the Scottish philosopher David Hume in the 18th century. And it's articulated in this particular manner, right, that we've got evil. And he says that, is God willing but unable to deal with evil? Is he willing but unable? I.e., does he have intent? but he's powerless, then he says that he is impotent. Is he able but not willing? So you flip it around. Is he able but not willing? I.e. he has the power, he has the capability, all right? He has the knowledge, but he's not willing. Then they say that he's malevolent, i.e. he's cruel, he's evil. And that is the charge that was being laid by, by Stephen Fry just earlier on. 
And then it says, is he both able or is capable? And is he willing? If that is the case, then well, where does evil come from? Where does evil come from? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him a God? But one of the important things is that if you remove God from the equation entirely, then you've got to still ask yourself, well, evil still exists. How do you deal with evil in a vacuous environment? Without any grounding, without any metaphysics. Take away God, remove him, banish him, do ever what, what you want, chain him, kill him, right? Call him names. Evil still runs rampage and wild. How do you deal with that? So even if you concede on their merits, which is, has no merits in the first place, but if you concede right at the early stage, how do you deal with these issues? Evil exists. So there are two problems. One is known as the logical problem, and it argues from that particular position. It says that the existence of evil is logically incompatible with the existence of an all-powerful, all-knowing, and an all-good God. Right? So it asserts that logically, Evil should not exist if such a God exists. That is the logical problem of evil. Now, there are three types of evil. There are three types, broad categories of evil. Okay. One is moral. The other one is natural. And the third one is systematic. Moral ones are the ones that we are capable as human beings who have free will, we're able to articulate in that space the kind of decisions and the choices that we make. Natural is what it says on the tin. Earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, tsunamis, all of those types of things. And the systematic one is just the natural process of what some people term the evolutionary aspects. The second problem is known as the evidential problem. It's very similar to the logical problem, but it's slightly different. And that's posed in this way, is that it questions whether the existence of evil makes the existence of a power, an all-loving and all-powerful God improbable. So it comes with it in a slightly different way. So there's a logical aspect to it. It says that the compatibility between having evil and a God which is all-loving those two things are, are incompatible and it becomes illogical. But this comes at it in a slightly different way. It's more emotive to very similar to what Stephen Fry was saying. It doesn't claim the logical impossibility in this case, but argues that the prevalence of suffering and the evil in the world right, gives serious doubts to, to the existence of God. Now, do you remember what I said earlier, right, is that this problem, in my view, is primarily predicated within a European Christian setting, right? Christianity, by and large, Western Christianity has had this problem. And this problem is when large numbers of people start to think that they're entitled to pleasure, right, that they have a problem. They want heaven on earth. They want everything now, and it's got to be one way. Any little prick, any little harm that comes along their way, right, for them is a problem. Okay. So it is, by and large, a post-enlightenment development. All right. And we did that in the second session. All right. We said that once you've ditched religion, you've got to replace that with some kind of metaphysics. Right? And Christianity, on its demise, was then replaced with what was known as a doctrine of progress. Doctrine of progress meant that you had to satisfy your own desires, and the individual was supreme in that. God is no longer supreme because he is dead. The individual now becomes the master 
and the service of that individual. And that individual choice becomes absolutely supreme. And there is then, then you, 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 you can then take control of nature in, in a way that has no boundaries. No longer are you custodian of nature, but now then you can pillage and you can use that for your own gratification. And a Jewish psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl, all right, who spent some time in the Nazi camps, concentration camps, he says that nowadays in the modern world, that more people today have the means to live, but have no meaning to live for. That you strip away meaning, right? And then you're trying to create heaven on earth, okay? Because you've got no afterlife. There's no afterlife. There's no life to come. This world, they say, is the only world that you get. This life is the only life that you get. So you might as well make the most of it. But we've talked about this in the past. If this world was the only world that you get, then when you die, you would never even know that you've lived a life in the first place. So it sucks identity, history, meaning, purpose, achievements, failures. Everything is completely sucked out. This life only makes sense if it's juxtaposed with the afterlife because then life continues and then you have a self-realization this is the way that i live this is the way that i behave this is what i do it's what nations did identity is retained history is retained value is retained that's why this life is even more important because this life is a springboard into the next world the eternal world afterwards okay, you cut away god Okay, then you're trying to make heaven on earth, then it becomes problematic. Now, we've got to understand what, who God is in this particular paradigm. Right? So we've spoke about it last time when we said that God is the contingent God. Sorry, God is the uncontingent God that everything depends upon. These are the typical 13 type of attributes that we believe as Muslims about the God that we worship and about the God that Stephen Fry says that we bow down to. He's a necessary being, right? He is absolutely necessary. He's dependent upon nobody. He's got no beginning and he's got no end. Right? He's the first and the last. He is utterly independent. He is transcendent. I.e., he is above space and time. He is completely one in his essence and his attributes, and he is living. Allah la ilaha illallah al qayyum. And then these are the three attributes that they argue against. Well, if he's got all knowledge and he's got will and he's got power. Then why doesn't he do something about evil? And you ask the Palestinians at the moment, you know, they say, well, where is God? In their hour of need. In their hour of need, where is God? There was a killing many years ago. I think it was in Hungerford. Hungerford is towards Bristol area. This must be about 17, 18 years ago. This is before I, I went out, out into the Middle East. And there was a shooting there where a number of children were shot. And John Humphreys was interviewing the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he said to him, where was God when those children were being shot? So it's a very powerful, really emotive type of thing. Where is God? Why doesn't God intervene? When people are being killed, when people are suffering, when people are being slaughtered. And then God is all hearing, is all seeing, and he has speech, he speaks as well. So these are the these are the main attributes. And remember, we said that the God that we worship is very different to the God of Christianity. Okay? I he has no partners, he is utterly one. 
Right. Stephen Fry says that I would have more, more as a truck with meeting a God who was a Greek God. Right? But a Greek God is not a God. He's a demigod. He's part human. All right? We don't worship Greek gods. We don't worship demigods. We don't worship idols. We don't worship gods that have children. Our God is utterly supreme. And it's a very different concept. The Tawhid concept of one God is very different to the monotheistic claim. You can have one idol, okay, which is one God. But it's not the same. It's very different. Very different. He is utterly transcendent. Utterly independent. Eternal being. So this is where we need to understand the sort of broader metaphysics. That as human beings, we are finite and we're corporal beings. God is utterly transcendent. Okay? He's uncreated and he's the Lord of the worlds. We are morally accountable. God is not morally accountable. So when you throw words like, you know, he's cruel, he's evil, those do not apply to a being who is outside space and time. Those are our terms. Right? We are being judged. We are being held to account. Not God. It's a really important point. God is supreme. He's sovereign. Okay? You can obviously question. People do this question and they have doubts. That's fine. There's no issues. Doubts and that's just part and parcel of the maturing process. All right. And that is an important part of that particular process as well. Okay. But we are flawed. We can make good decisions and we can make some very bad, bad choices. He has maximal perfection. His knowledge, his wisdom and his will are perfect. We have a finite mind. We've got no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. We've got no idea what's going to happen to us, us in the future. Absolutely no idea. Right? God knows everything. He knows the past, the present, and the future as though that it's already happened. And there's a quote from the Bible which I thought was really good. That which is, is what already has been. And that which will be, B has already been. I forgot he doesn't have to wait for the time to pass for us and then think about things and say, well, you know, someone's going to go to heaven, someone's going to do this, someone's going to be able to do this. He knows every permutation. Right? He knows everything. Right? So it's like time has collapsed. Okay. He's our creator and our Lord. All right, he is not under test. We cannot challenge his supremacy. We cannot, at the day of judgment, argue, God, why did you do this? God will argue with us, what did you do? Not that, not the other way around. That is hubris. There is an element of arrogance there that you can talk to his majesty in that way when all of the veils will be lifted and reality will be seen in his pure, purest form. Okay. And there's, there needs to be a recognition at that point that if somebody has made a mistake, all right, I'll come back to that point. There are these particular hadith that really point to that. If someone has made a mistake, they recognize that they made a mistake. She say, I'm sorry. I'm at fault. Oh Lord, forgive me. That would be a much better position. Not to say that I will stand firm and I will hold God to account. Well, good luck on you. So we're being tested. And that's a very, very important point. Now, when I said that this problem of evil is nestled within a European Christian mindset. If you have a look at the Christian worldview of why we're on this earth, 
It's very different to the Islamic metaphysics. Completely different. The reason why we're on this earth from a Christian perspective is that we were kicked out of heaven. If Adam had not sinned, or Adam and Eve had not sinned, then we would have stayed in heaven forever. But the Islamic position is very different. Even before the creation of man, right? God says to the angels, I'm going to create man and he will be my viceroy on the earth. Meaning that we were already destined, predestined to be on the earth. But it was just about the timing. Right? And Christ, from a Christian perspective, has come to backfill that original sin. Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge. They committed a sin that was so huge, so humongous, that God didn't have the capacity to actually forgive. He had to sacrifice blood. He had to sacrifice his own son in order to redeem that particular original sin. Not all Christians believe in that, but some do. From an Islamic perspective, okay, that in my view in particular, I don't deem it as a sin at all. It was just a test. God just says, don't approach this tree. There's nothing wrong with the tree. Right? Remember, he was a newborn baby in a sense. He's learning, saying, why did God not want me to approach that tree? God just said, don't approach that tree. But he's curious, and now he's being tempted, right? So you've got God on one side, and you've got the devil on the other side. God said to Adam and Eve, don't approach the tree. Or the devil said, if you approach the tree, right, you'll be angels, or you'll live forever. But he's in paradise. <laughs> he doesn't have the want of anything. But remember when God told the angels to bow down. He said, I want you to bow down to Adam. They all bowed down except Iblis. And God knew that Iblis wouldn't bow down. He didn't need to show that. Who's he showing? He's showing Adam. Adam, look, this guy is your enemy. Don't follow him. That was the purpose of that particular event. He's saying, look, he's showing you, demonstrating. This is just not telling you, he's demonstrating. So there's a difference in learning when you're showing somebody something rather than just telling them how to do something. Right? God is not just saying, oh, he's your enemy, be aware. God is saying, look at what he did. He's your enemy. I've told him. I, God has told him to bow down and he refused. And he's in heaven, so he's a believer. Right? So the when he ate from the tree, right, that was when God said, now you're ready. Okay? You have failed in order to pass. Now you're ready to leave the earth. That was it. It was just a trigger for when he had to come down. He didn't kill anybody. He didn't murder anybody. He didn't lie. He, didn't do anything. he just ate from a, from a tree. All right? And God forgave that particular event and God taught him what to say but from a Christian perspective evil enters into the world at that point right if you read the Genesis I can't remember the particular verses and God says that women will have childbirth pains right man is on this earth to be punished the ground right or well, the ground on which you would live that's been damned. So the whole narrative is one of punishment, one of ordeal, one of suffering, right from the outset because we've done something wrong or our father has done something wrong. Had he not done that, then we wouldn't have been. You know, so from an Islamic perspective, it's very different. No, you will suffer, but it's suffering for a different reason. You'll be pressed on the skin, right? to see how you're tested. If you've got a test environment, 
This world is an environment of test. For it to be tested, you're going to be stretched and people are going to be stretched in different ways. And from an Islamic metaphysics perspective, if a woman who dies in childbirth, she's considered the martyr. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a real high status. So it's very different when you compare and contrast. But we believe Christianity to be the kith and kin from an Abrahamic faith. But Islam has come to perfect all of the historical true faiths. It's just a continuation of the true faiths and it's the most perfection of the short past narrative. Now, this is what really European mindset has been rebelling against. And like I said many times, you know, we should think, well, why did Christianity go the atheistic way and why didn't they come to Islam? That's our challenge. That is something that we really need to work on. You know, people are going towards Buddhism or Hinduism or Stoicism, things like that. And then some of them, they find their way to, to, to Islam as well. So from our some metaphysics perspective, from an Islamic worldview, you remember we had the ontology and the epistemology and the Lucidus. This is just a little bit of a smallest or, or a part of that. Right? Our worldview has got it is at its center. And the atheistic worldview doesn't have God at all. All right. And we say that human life is fused with meaning and purpose. We're being tested. All right. We're being tested in action. Not just belief, not just in words, oh, I believe, really? Prove it, God says. Prove it when you're in placed in a little bit of difficulty. Prove it when you've lost your job. Prove it when you've lost a loved one. Prove it when something else, something else like that happens. And for us, this particular life is piddly in contrast to eternity. Right? 60 year life or 70 year life or an 80 or even a 100 year life if you place that on side by side to eternity it's completely obliterated it just doesn't even it's not even a blip and yet it's important because as i said it's a springboard into the hereafter but if you take the hereafter out of your entire metaphysics and say, well, look, there is no hereafter. Right? There is no God. It's a brute fact that we're here. There is no afterlife. There's no judgment day. Okay? Whatever we suffer, all right, we wouldn't know about it. All right? If we've had any enjoyment, we wouldn't know about it. Right? But the Quran says that those, that those people will suffer in this world and in the next. What a, what, what a damn, damn, damn position. What a horrible position to if you find ourselves in. So from an Islamic perspective, we've got to have a look at the wider, broader lens. And it's really important. Okay? So remember when I, was, when I talked about the ontological position of what exists in terms of realities. This nestles in that particular part. We've got free will and we've got intellect. It's right on top of our brains, right? On top of the visual body. And, and we've got language in order to be able to communicate, to, to think. It's primarily language is used as a means of thinking. And then it's a, as a use of, of this communication as well. Because if you've got no language, you can't think. And then as a result of that, we've got moral accountability. Should I do this? Should I go that way? Should I pray? Should I not pray? Should I give charity? Should I not give charity? Should I oppress? Should I not oppress? Should I be just? Should I be kind? All of these types of things come into play and we have moral accountability. If we had no moral accountability or no free will, if free will was taken away from us, all right, and then all that we did was to mow the lawn every single day, right? You know, you get up in the morning and you mow the lawn and then you go to sleep, right? Life would not be life. 
free will is precisely there. When it's there, it's got to be nestled in problems, pleasures, evil, good, the interplay of all of these particular aspects. So life in that sense is dotted in the Quran everywhere. Life is a test. And you will suffer as part of that test. It doesn't shy away from it. You will suffer. You will be tested. And those that are tested the most are often those that God loves the most. And the prophets are the ones who have been tested the most. Because they're completely sinless as well. Completely sinless. And the third pillar, which is really important, is the afterlife. So all of that taken together gives you a much broader and a wider perspective. Take away God, the afterlife collapses. And then it's just a vicious, dark, dark place to be. You know, well, why am I suffering? What's the purpose of me suffering? What's going on with the Palestinians? Why are they suffering? got to look at things from a wider lens and a deeper perspective. So without free will, you can't have free will if there's no suffering. Okay, You can't have a test without suffering for the interplay of good and bad. And that wider purpose has got to be nestled both within this world and in the afterlife as an outcome of the test. Because then you can't go to heaven or to hell directly. So often people say, well, why weren't we kept in heaven right at the beginning? Well, what have you done to deserve heaven or hell? Nothing. Why should you go to heaven? At the outset, God has created you so that you know him. And then he says, I want you to believe in me and I want you to do good deeds. You don't deserve to, 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 to go into heaven directly. But there's no purpose of that. Right? Atheists say the view of God is incoherent, it's absurd. Like I said, that if we were to concede their terms, right, that there is no God, what do you do with evil? What do you do with that child who died of bone cancer. What, what would you say if someone died early? Someone died at the age of 15 or someone died at the age of 70 in a godless world. For that person, it makes no difference. It makes no difference if he was Julius Caesar or if he was a normal person. It makes absolutely no difference. It makes no difference if it was killed by bone cancer or by hurricane or by a tsunami makes no difference and people say, ah, oh, poor chap had a short life, right? All of those kind of terms that we use, we just don't know, right? So that's completely vacuous, right? Islamic metaphysics is always on the front foot, always on the front foot. You just need to know how to articulate those types of positions. The atheistic narrative is vacuous in that sense. They have points of contention which are important to answer. Don't get me wrong. Okay, but when you peel over it and you start to create the wider narrative that Islamic metaphysics gives you, then it really does. It's a very powerful, really powerful tool. God tests those whom he loves the most. God tests the prophets the most. One of the really you know, sad, troubling stories is about the story of Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi salatu salam. I, it is really heart-rendering that here is a prophet at very old age, very old age, right? He's given a son, right? And he has to take this son and he has to drop him off 
of of Tobacco Mecca now, right? And just leave him there. He doesn't even turn around, and, you know, say, "You're right. There's no hotels there. There's no tents. There's there's there, there isn't even water there, right? It's utterly barren, utterly deserted place. Right? It's really really harsh. He's got to leave his son, right, and, and his wife in that particular barren place. And when he goes back to visit him, God says that I want you and your son to, to lay the foundations of the Kaaba so that they build the Kaaba. And you would have thought that after building the Kaaba, God would have rewarded them and say, well, well done. You built the Kaaba. Great job. No. He says, I want you to now take the life of that young child that I gave you at such a tender age, old age, right? Which meant that the longing for that particular child was so intense because now I want you to take away that child with your own hand. Now, that is so heart-wrenching and it's very difficult to actually fathom. God says, I want you to do it with your own hands. Now, these are very, very difficult questions. Right? How do you understand that particular story? But the story goes on, and it doesn't involve just one soul. It involves two souls. It, it, it involves two souls, and the father says to the son that this is what has been asked of me by God. What do you have to say? Now, he could have said, you know, Dad, I've got to get married. I've got to get a car. I've got to get a house. I've got to see the world. You know, I've got to do all of these things. You know, I'm just a young kid. You know, I've got to live a life. Right? He could have run away. And every right to. Right? If he had any reason, right? That was the reason, right? But he says, you know what, you know, do what you have to do and you will find me patient. Both of these souls harbor supreme souls, that they're prophetic souls. Meaning that we belong to God. We are His, at His disposal. Right? And they are willing, when it says, to when God says to Ibrahim, submit, and he said, I have submitted. That is submission. Islam means to submit. To what? To whom? For what purpose? And they showed us what it means to submit in ways that we could never imagine. And the very story is told that you shouldn't kill your children. That is the underlying reason for that particular narrative to be displayed. That you should not kill your children. And there's so many stories and the stories of the other prophets, stories of Sayyidina Musa, he's having a dialogue with this particular sage in Surah Qaf. Right? And he doesn't understand why a Sukhidr has done certain things. And he's, you know, he's really impatient. We're impatient. We don't know why God does, does certain things. Right? The story of Sayyidina Yusuf, for example, you know, his father, you know, his father is a prophet. Yusuf's father is Israel, Yaqub. His father is it's hard. I mean, having a grandfather like that, his great grandfather is Ibrahim I mean, what a lineage. I mean, what a lineage. I mean, the, the perfect family. That's Sayyidina Ibrahim's grandson, and those people who've been to Khalil in Palestine, Sayyidina Ibrahim is buried next to his wife Sarah right? and then his son is buried next to him with his wife 
And then Yahub is buried. And then Sayyidina Yusuf is buried in that same mosque. But there was a massacre some, some years ago when an Israeli settler went into the, the Israel mosque with a submachine gun, sub or automatic machine gun, and he killed uh, around 27 or 29 worshippers during the month of Ramadan at Fajr time. And they now split it up. The Israelis have split up that place. That's the place, and you've got Sayyidina Ibrahim on one side and Sayyidina Ishaq, and then Yaqub and Yusuf on the other. So he was thrown into a well. And he's a prophet of God. I mean, you know, he's, his lineage is, is immaculate. When you think, well, what a problem, right? Why did he have to be thrown in a well? But if you don't know the full story, then you won't understand why he was thrown into the well. Basically to save himself from his brothers, right? Right? He was being protected by his brothers. Zayd, who had the honor of being called for a short time the son of Muhammad sallallahu This is before prophethood. This is before prophethood. It's captured, sold, passed from one hand to another, and then settles into the household of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa well before his prophethood. Sends a message. He's in Mecca, sees members of his tribe and he sends a message to them and they come and his father and his uncle come to collect him and they go to the Prophet and again he's not a messenger yet right? he hasn't been appointed a messenger and he says name us your price we've come to free our son so he says I'll do whatever Zaid wants me to do to do and he calls in Zed and he says that do you know who these two gentlemen are? See how he starts the conversation. He's confirming identity and the acknowledgement of that bondship. And he says that one is my father and one is my uncle. He says that they've come to take you away. What do you want to do? Exactly the same story as saying that Ibrahim in a slightly different way. He says that what do you want to do? Not his father, not his uncle. He says that what do you want to do? He says, I want to stay with you. He's a slave. His father and his uncle are outraged. How can you choose slavery over freedom? How can you choose this man over your own father and your uncle? He said, I've seen from this man things that I could never have imagined. And it's just a, it's a game changer. It's a game changer of his character. The Prophet takes Zed into Mecca or towards the Israel sanctuary and he proclaims from this day, hey, he is my son. And that was obviously abrogated that the Prophet is no father of anybody. And uh, that was quite important. But, but it shows you pre him becoming a Prophet or anointed as becoming a Prophet, his magnanimity, his character, and the difference in his particular household. You would have thought that poor Zed, right, the world would have fallen under his feet. Right? But he was then as taken into the household of the messenger's house. I mean, what a privilege. What an honor. What a standing. Just absolutely amazing. So in that context, so when life is rolled out to its full, when life is then rolled over into the this afterlife okay then it shows you the full picture of what we've been doing god rolls things out the whole time in the quran it takes you from where you are takes you to the past look at all these nations that have been completely destroyed where are they look at their arrogance where are they now look to the future and talks, talks about heaven and hell, talks about the day of judgment, talks about all of those. Constant reminder, live for that life. Don't live for this life. Don't, live, don't sell your poultry, don't sell your soul for paltry things. that has no intrinsic value. 
you've got to steal to be able to actually do something. You've got to oppress somebody in order to be able to actually get to the greasy ladder. You've got to overpower. No, God says, I have power over all of you. And you will meet me one day. Beware of that day. Beware of that day. And going back to the likes of Stephen Fry and all of those, there is a Hadith Qudsi that a man who had led a beautiful life, I mean, of luxury, of whatever, right, ease, he was dipped into hell just once for a momentary second. For a momentary second. I mean, just the, uh, you know, a very, very short, short time. And then his Lord asked him, have you ever had any pleasure? He goes, Lord, I've never felt pleasure before. So there's a person who'd lived a pleasurable life, been dipped in hell. And conversely, there was a man who had a miserable life, hardship, pain, all sorts of things. He was then dipped into heaven. Dipped, just for a moment really. And then asked that question by his Lord. Have you ever had any hardship or suffering? He says, no, my Lord, I've never. It's that, again, it's that, it's a real metaphor for us to be able to see how this world compares. Right? How this world compares. In another hadith, this is the one that I'm alluding to. There was one man, he says, that he told his children, he said, when I die, I want you to burn me. I want you to burn me and get my ashes and I want you to scatter them all over the place. All right? Because if God catches me, boy, am I in trouble. So clearly he's done something horrible wrong, right? You know, the, the actual hadith, I don't think it talks about what he did, but he clearly felt a huge amount of guilt, a huge amount of pain on his shoulders. But look at the difference. When God God then tells the earth, raise up this man. For God it's easy, right? You can't, you know, raise up, make this man up again. And he raises him up. And even though God knows why he did that, it's to teach us, right? God asks him, why did you do what you did? Why did he? And he just said simply, I was afraid of this day. Right. I'm paraphrasing. I'm afraid of this day, the meeting you and the guilt and the suffering and this evil that I have committed. Right? And that's why. And God said, I forgive you. So having hope in God's forgiveness is really important. Doesn't matter how bad you are. But if you say, you know what, when I meet God, I'm going to you know, I'm going to punch him in the face or I'm going to tell him what my views are, and, you know. I, that, you, you know, I mean, that's not going to work, right? You know, so having a level of humility, it's telling you, have humility. We will sin, all of us, every single one of us. Big, small, compounded, continuum, that's just the nature of us. The one who doesn't repent, the one who's not sorry, that's the one that we should really feel sorry for. Not that you've made a mistake. We will, <laughs> we will continue to make mistakes day in and day out. Right? But to feel at least ashamed that we've made a mistake and knowing that our Lord might, might look down upon us in a, in a way. And that's, that's important. Literature. Right? All good literature, all good movies, from Star Wars to whatever it is, right? All of the great literature from Shakespeare, all of them, they play on the interplay of the opposites. And in particular, suffering and evil. And the way that people are able to get out of it or not get out of it all of the time. All right? So why can man create suffering in their literature? And God who creates the world, he can't do that. You know, what right do we have that God can't do? Well, what he wants to do, and yet we can do what we want to do. All great literature, if you take out suffering, 
right? If you take out those kind of interplays within a movie, then it's just boring. Mr. and Mrs. Jones mowed the lawn and they went to sleep again and they mowed the lawn. There's no intrigue. There's no murder. There's no suspense. Suspense is when someone's lurking behind the corner and you're doing something horribly wrong, right? When you didn't expect. So the greater the suffering or the greater that you've got to get out of it. So look at how we mold and shape our own works, our own hands, our own minds. Okay? And yet we deny that to our Lord. So a believer who suffers in this world knows eternity in paradise and he knows that God is all loving and is merciful. And there's an element of solace, patience purpose, all is well with the believers. There's a verse in Surah Al-Baqarah. That, um, that it says that we will certainly try you with something of fear and hunger and the loss of property and the lives and lives and the fruits. But give those good news to the patient. It doesn't mean that we don't struggle, we don't strive to get out of that suffering. Right? It's not that you say that we're just patient in our adversity. Right? Who then when misfortune befalls them says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. They are those upon whom are blessings and mercy. So there are two, there are two rewards. There's a blessing and mercy from their Lord. And they are the followers on the right path. And just have a look at what's going on now at, now at the moment in terms of the situation in the in US Palestine. Right. That's the ultimate loss of virtually everything. Okay. And they don't bemoan the way that those people here who live in luxury bemoan a loss or a suffering. They call out to their Lord and they cry and they, they do all, all, all of those things. But look at just how they deal with these very, very difficult, very difficult situations. There's a different mindset at play. So I'll I'll stop there and I'll take any questions and if there's any comments and I hope that's been helpful. Any yes or less questions? Yes, ma'am. 